There's no shortage of Heinkel 162 videos on YouTube and you might ask yourself, do we need another one? But all of them have one thing in common. They pay little or no attention to the fighter's actual combat record. Probably because the record is very modest, but this doesn't stop us from exploring it in detail. Contrary to the usual German practice, an existing unit was chosen as the first one to convert to the new jet fighter. It was the first Gruppe of Jagdgeschwader 1, previously equipped with Focke Wolf 190. The decision was made on 29 January 1945. On 8 February, the Gruppe pilots handed over their remaining Focke Wolfs and went by land from Gartz in northeast Germany to Parhim. No Heinkel 162s were available, so the pilots focused on theoretical training, taught by test pilots and technicians. The first few examples of Heinkel 162s only arrived in late March, and on 31st of the month, pilots were able to make their first flights. These flights lasted between 6 and 15 minutes and no problems were experienced, although the pilots were told not to exceed 600 km per hour for the risk of breakup in the air. Six more aircraft arrived by the 7th of April, and Jagdgeschwader's second Gruppe was also ordered to convert to Heinkel 162, but they wouldn't receive any aircraft for a few more days. Pilots described the Heinkel jet as stable and responsive to controls. One of them said that it was quiet in the air, as opposed to the ground where the engine noise was unbearable. On 6th of April, the airfield at Parchim suffered a heavy Allied air raid and the unit was ordered to transfer to Ludwigslust. Several days later, the unit was at its new location with between 13 and 16 airframes. About 40 pilots were available, but no more than 10 training flights per day could be made. A couple of takeoff and landing incidents occurred, but the first tragedy happened in mid-April. An experienced Feldwebel Friedrich Enderle was killed as his Heinkel failed to climb after takeoff. The airplane crashed and exploded within the airfield boundary. An automatic flaps retraction was suspected as the cause. The first contact with an enemy airplane was made on 15th of April by Rudolf Schmidt. Schmidt saw a Spitfire south of Hamburg, but his orders were not to engage. On that day, the first Gruppe was ordered to move from Ludwigslust to Lech, near the Danish border. The British 21st Army Group was rapidly approaching their previous home base. The transfer was not smooth, and it took two days. Unteroffizier Wolfgang Hartung crashed his Heinkel in the process and was killed. Sources don't specify the exact reason. Six Spitfires were spotted by Helmut Rehl during the transfer flight, but again, there was no combat. It was only on 19 April 1945 that the first Gruppe was finally operational and it was assigned to patrol the airspace over Schleswig-Holstein, where RAF aircraft were operating almost at will. At 12.22, two Heinkel 162s were scrambled to intercept enemy fighters reported to be in the vicinity. The flight leader was Lieutenant Gerhard Stiemer, with Feldwebel Gunther Kirchner as his wingman. According to Stiemer's recollection, immediately after takeoff, while the Heinkels were on less than 50 meters of altitude, two enemy fighters appeared behind them. Stiemer identified them as P-47 Thunderbolts, which attacked Kirchner. Stima then saw his wingman attempt an ejection, but as he was too low, his ejection seat didn't work and the parachute failed to open. Kirchner was killed. The two Allied airplanes were almost certainly misidentified by Stima, 
as there is no record of thunderbolts operating in the area at that time. It's far more likely that they were Hawker Tempest Mark V's belonging to RAF 2nd Tactical Air Force, which were engaged in fighter sweeps over German airfields in the area that day. In fact, another German Heinkel 162 pilot, Wolfgang Wollenweber, recalls that the Allied airplanes were indeed British. He also says that the German wingman Kirchner attempted a sharp 180 degree turn. At such low speeds, this was an extremely dangerous maneuver in the Heinkel 162, and the airplane rolled on its back and fell to the ground like an autumn leaf. Kirchner attempted an ejection, but his airplane was upside down and the ejection seat shot him into the ground. This was the first recorded case of a Heinkel 162 pilot attempting to use the ejection seat with which the airplane was equipped. The flight leader, Stima, was happy that the Allied fighters didn't attack him as his landing gear failed to retract. He immediately landed. A Tempest pilot opened fire on his Heinkel, but Lek airfield flag batteries hit the British fighter. The pilot had to crash land and he was soon captured. In the Allied records, there is no perfect match for this incident, but there is a close one. RAF's number 222 squadron, equipped with Hawker Tempest, was flying fighter sweeps in the general area at the time. Flight Lieutenant Jeffrey Walkington reported spotting an aircraft flying away from the airfield at Husum, at about 500 feet. Walkington was strafing the airfield and he saw an unidentified aircraft flying in a northerly direction. He couldn't recognize the type, but he said it had twin fins, single engine and mottled green camouflage. The wings resembled those of a BF-109. Walkington attempted to chase the aircraft, but as he lost speed on turning, the enemy pulled away. But as the German aircraft started to make a starboard turn, Walkington was able to cut inside it in approach to about 1000 yards. He then fired several short bursts and the German aircraft pulled up through the clouds. Walkington still followed and then spotted the enemy aircraft spinning out of control at about 3,500 feet. It eventually crashed into the ground. It's uncertain if Walkington shot down a Heinkel 162. He places the encounter at Husum, which is 35 kilometers south of Lek. But Heinkels did fly out of Husum as well, and they used it during their transfer from Ludwigslust. German accounts place the loss of Kirchner's Heinkel at Lek airfield and Kirchner crashed much sooner after the takeoff than what is described in Walkington's report. There are no other Heinkel 162 losses recorded on that date, and Walkington might have shot down another aircraft type. We might never know the exact truth, but one thing is certain, the Volksjäger suffered its first combat loss. The next day, 20th of April, Four 162s were ordered to take off and intercept RAF Typhoons reportedly attacking targets in the area. Oberleutnant Wollenweber's aircraft had trouble starting and he only took off 10 minutes after the other three aircraft. Wollenweber climbed to 3000 meters and headed for Husum. He then discovered that his ready gun sight wasn't functioning so he used the backup manual sight. When he approached Husum, he saw that anti-aircraft defense was active. 
He was flying at about 900 km per hour as he spotted RAF aircraft attacking ground targets. He picked the last one and pressed his trigger once he came to about 100 meters. Nothing happened. Vollendweber passed extremely close to the canopy of the next typhoon and then climbed away. RAF fighters attempted to catch him, but in his words, he was like someone on a moped trying to catch a Porsche. An opportunity to achieve a kill was lost. Interestingly, Vollendweber in his report also misidentified the Allied fighters as thunderbolts. Two Heinkels were lost that same day for technical reasons. Leutnant Schmidt bailed out successfully, apparently using his ejection seat, which seems to be the first such case among the Volksjäger pilots. Unteroffizier Fendler was less lucky and he was killed. There was another loss the next day and the pilot survived, but it's unclear if he used his ejection seat or not. Heinkel 162 pilots even flew a small number of ground attack missions, strafing enemy columns on the road between Lek and Husum. Not many details are known about these missions. On 30th of April, Lieutenant Hans Rechenberg was attacked by a Spitfire while ferrying a Heinkel 162 from Horstock to Lech. The aircraft crashed near Wiesma and Reichenberg survived, but sources don't agree if he crash landed or bailed out. It's unclear which Allied pilot attacked Reichenberg's Heinkel, but a likely candidate is Flight Lieutenant Fleming from No. 403 Squadron, who claimed the BF 108 Typhoon in that area. Some pilots from No. 412 Squadron also claimed BF 109s, and it could have been one of them. By May the 3rd, Lech was one of the few operational Luftwaffe airfields and many different aircraft types gathered there. About 45 Heinkel 162s are estimated to have been available at that moment. At 11.38, on May the 4th, just a few hours before the surrender of German Northwest Army Command, Lieutenant Rudolf Schmidt took off in his Heinkel with a wingman. They were going to engage some RAF typhoons. They found him southeast of Husum airfield at 11.45. There was a brief encounter and Schmidt wrote in his log, Typhoon wirksam beschossen, Abschuss nicht bestätig. That translates to, Typhoon fired on with effect, shoot down not confirmed. The first phrase was often used to describe successful destruction of ground targets. This doesn't confirm that the RAF aircraft was shot down by Schmidt, but he might have achieved hits. One Allied loss roughly corresponded with the area, and it was a Tempest flown by Flying Officer Tom Austin, 
of number 486 squadron. This Tempest reportedly crash landed because of engine trouble in Zatrup area. The time of the crash, however, doesn't correspond as it's set to about 7 a.m. Lieutenant Humph remembers that a captured RAF pilot was brought to the squadron that evening and that Schmidt claimed he had shot him down. The RAF pilot, however, replied that he had been shot down by anti-aircraft fire. While it's unlikely that Olof Schmidt shot down Tom Austin's Tempest or any other Allied plane, the confusion of the final hours of World War II could explain the discrepancies. So, what is the combat record summary of the People's Fighter? There is one unlikely victory claim. At least one, probably two Heinkel 162s were lost to enemy fighters either as a maneuvering kill or as a result of gunfire. At least nine pilots were killed in various accidents, while in several other cases pilots survived the loss of airplanes. Accidents can be attributed to failures of airframe, engine or simply the trickiness of flying the type. Of course, the entire outcome can't be attributed only to the fighter design, but to the overall extremely difficult circumstances in which it operated. Thank you for watching. Consider becoming a Patreon supporter or donating on PayPal to keep the channel in business. And keep watching Showtime 1-1-2.